Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Thaler. I'm an engineer at Microsoft, and I work on open source and standards. And today we're going to talk about eBPF for Windows. Now, Microsoft does a lot of different things that relate to eBPF in some way, right? And so we came to the eBPF Summit last year, uh, which was great. And we heard even in the audience, there were audience questions to the presenter saying, so when can we get eBPF for Windows, right? We'd already been thinking about doing this because we've been hearing the same questions ourselves. And so that just gave us confidence that says, okay, maybe the community would really want us to do this. And so that's when we started this initiative that we're gonna talk about today. So there's a couple different things that are properties of eBPF that are really attractive that we don't already have really in the Windows world. So the first one it has to do with flexibility, right? We have APIs such as the Windows filtering platform, which is what people use to develop firewalls and filter drivers. Drivers are the equivalent of Linux kernel modules that you use to extend the kernel by writing uh, code. And uh, the things like the APIs that we have today are have sort of fixed schemas, right? Like five tuples and so forth, where you can't necessarily do arbitrary things. And so the flexibility EBPF provides, where you can have the packet, full set of you know, helpers and stuff that you can do relatively arbitrary things. So subject to whatever the verifier has uh, lets you do. So um, that's an attractive property to many people. Second one is that when somebody writes a driver, the way that it works is you send it off to Microsoft to get signed, right? Because the kernel is not going to load it unless it carries a Microsoft signature. So you got to send your driver off to Microsoft to get signed. And an extra delay is not always desirable if you're just trying to extend something in the kernel for observability or DOS protection or whatever. And so this notion that says, how do I write some code, get it verified and jitted, and put it into, the, into execution right now without having to wait? Okay? And the last one is that the whole notion of the safety properties that the verifier provides is often much stronger than the types of tests and things that Microsoft will run before signing somebody else's driver. So you can say, well, if I run it through this verifier, then I can get a stronger level of reliability and security confidence. Okay. So all these are very attractive properties that customers have said, can we get eBPF for Windows for these reasons? So we said, okay, let's see what we can do here. So we put together this project with an architecture that we tried to keep as similar as possible to, to uh, the architecture that we're all familiar with on Linux. Okay? Now, Windows itself has some unique properties there that we'll talk about there. So we can say spot the differences between the next two pictures. Right? So here's our classic Linux picture with tool chains like VCC. We have libraries like libbpf. And you have things that exist in the kernel where your verifier and your JIT compiler and interpreter and so on are. And you have components like TCP IP stack, et cetera, that expose eBPF hooks and helpers. Okay. So let's go forward to the eBPF for Windows version of this slide. So here we go. There's a couple things that you'll notice that are different. Okay. So first of all, let me talk about the key. What's the color coding here? Okay. Straight blue is things that are unchanged from Windows. Okay. Because we want this to work without having to change Windows. So if people already have Windows deployed, how do they want eBPF now for the Windows they already have without having to wait for a future version of Windows? Okay. So the blue is unchanged Windows components. So we said all of this is on Windows, not in Windows. Okay. So you've already got Windows and you install on there eBPF on top of existing Windows. Okay. So that's the blue. And so how do we do that? And we'll talk about that. That's the shim that we'll get back to. Okay. Otherwise, all of the green components are regular open source projects. So one of our goals was to say, we don't want to reinvent anything. We want to reuse as much as possible so that we're all using common code for things like you know, libbpf and BCC and so on. Okay. So all the dark green is open source projects that already exist that we just want to run on top of Windows. Okay. Some of them we have to participate in to make sure they can get compiled on Windows if they were compiled to be Linux only or whatever in the, in the CMake files or whatever they're using. Okay? So we have to work with them. Uh, but the point is the light green is the hosting infrastructure. How do you make that map to the Windows internals? Like how do you compile as a Windows driver? How do you make a Windows syscall? Right, that sort of thing. How do you host a, how do you compile as a Windows library or host a service, that type of thing. And so that's what the light green is intended to be. Now, let me talk a bit about uh, maybe the libbpf in the, in the middle, which is one that is kind of uh, uh, the next step here, because you know we've got the verifier, the JIT compiler, the interpreter, and so on that work great, the same on Windows and other platforms. libbpf is one that we still got to work with, where that one has a bunch of Linux-specific code, where the goal is to factor that into parts that are cross-platform versus the parts that are inherently specific to the platform. 
Like today, LibEPF tends to combine those two that have the cross-platform, you know, the generic LibEPF code, plus how do I actually call the Linux syscall, BPF syscall, that kind of thing. And we really want to factor those such that the bottom part there, that light green lib, is the how do you call the Windows-specific code underneath the covers while still keeping all of the business logic of LibEPF on top. And so that's why you see this little split there as to where we want LibEPF to evolve, okay? Uh, another example, I'll get to this on the next slide, which is the verifier and the jitter. We have those running up in uh, user mode or user land. Um, and then the last piece that I'll talk about now is where you see the EPF shim in the bottom middle. So I mentioned the way that you extend the Windows kernels by writing a driver, right? Both the execution context driver, the light green box on the bottom right, as well as the eBPF shim are drivers on Windows, okay? So the eBPF shim, we have a driver that's in the project right now that consumes on the left, the public Windows API is exposed by existing versions of Windows. And on the right, it translates in those into eBPF hooks and helpers that we know, okay? And so it's the shim that sits in between those and that gets installed as a driver. Um, this actually has two different colors because the one that we have in the project right now is all open source in the project that sits on top of public APIs, right? But somebody could do the same thing and extend, put an eBPF shim on any driver that somebody wants to do. So even somebody's private driver that exposes private APIs, if you got your own Windows driver right now, you could have your own eBPF shim for it. Or in the future, there could be drivers that expose eBPF uh, hooks and helpers directly without having to have a shim. That's kind of the ideal world that, we'll, that we want to get to, right? But in the meantime, we want to don't want anybody to wait, and so hence the shim idea, okay? And we can have multiple of these, and that's why there's kind of both colors there, because you could have one shim that calls some agents that sits for some hooks and helpers, and another shim for other ones, okay? And so a lot of variety here, and I'll talk more about why uh, that's a separate driver from the execution context, although some of it may be obvious now. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so let's talk more about the why the verifier and the jitter we put those in user mode. Well, well, one reason, I guess, just during development, you get better reliability and security. It's easier to debug stuff if it's running up in user mode and sitting in the kernel. But, you know, security aspect is that, you know, some security people have argued that if you put the verifier and the jitter in a different address base from the kernel itself, then things like side channel attacks, you know, Spectre and so on, start to become a lot harder, less, less ability to expose kernel secrets and so on. Um, but the, probably the first reason that we did it was we had white was again, because we wanted to reuse existing projects, right? We found existing projects like UBPF and Prevail and so on that already had ready-made libraries for doing jitting, verification and so on uh, that were easy to make work up in user mode libraries, but were really hard to make work in uh, the Windows kernel. Okay. So by putting stuff in user mode, then that meant, hey, less work for us to do. We can get stuff up and running uh, and use it now, right, without having to wait. However, we think it's also a good building block. We'll probably want to keep it there, right, for a couple of reasons. So one is we aspire to have hooks and helpers exposed, not just from the kernel, but from things like user mode demons or, you know, Windows services, that type of thing. And so you can have some programs attached to the kernel. You can have some eBPF programs attached to, say, a user mode service. And how do we do that with the same verification and ginning libraries? Well, we think that the architecture that we have is one that will naturally lend itself to that, to doing that on Windows. Okay. And so this notion of wanting to run, say, you know, the, the jitter up in user mode is the same desire as like the UVPF project has. So there's this nice synergy between projects that let us work together with other projects, which has been great. So our goal for these building blocks, you know, the jitter, interpreter, verifier, and so on, is we want them to be cross-platform, to work on you no know, Linux, Windows, anything else, okay, and context agile. And what I mean by that is that the library itself, the code is not written to be kernel code or user land code. It's just written to be code that can be linked either way. Okay? And that allows use of many different contexts, right? We've experimented with stuff inside like an SGX Enclave and so on. And so the more different context agile it is, the more reusable it is, the better it is for all of us because now we're focusing the community efforts all on one code base or a small number of code bases rather than fragmenting across one for every platform. So. So that means that our goal for the eBPF for Windows project is that this, rep this repository should really only have code in it that's inherently Windows specific, right? How do you actually compile an actual Windows driver, right? How do you actually make the underlying Windows system call, right? How do you reference count a Windows object? What's the relationship to the Windows file system, which is different from how the Linux file system works and so on, right? The file system um, subsystem. 
And so how do you have that mapping there underneath the covers? And that's the code that's really meant to be in this repository. Everything else is like core business logic. We'd rather keep it out of this repository and keep that in other cross-platform projects. It's not specific to Windows and just work with those. Okay? Some of those I mentioned, we've done that already between the interpreter, the jitter and the verifier. Um, some of the ones are still work that needs to be done, such as in uh, libbpf is an example of one that uh, we want to, is kind of the next big step to do so. All right, let's keep going here. Let's talk more about security, right? Because people have asked us, you know, when can I actually run the thing, right? And the point is that I mentioned that the Windows kernel will only load code that gets, you know, signed for production, okay? Well, that's not going to happen until the security hardening work is done. Until then, you can run demos in the test signing mode, and you're just not going to run it in production, but you can make the demo, but it's not necessarily secure. We got to get the security hardening done, okay? And this is something that's not going to happen overnight. We started the project early because we want this to be done as part of a community effort. Okay? And so there's an active work going on in these areas. We've experimented with at least two different ways of having that little secure environment up in user mode to be able to host the jitter and the uh, verifier. Uh, we've tried it inside, say, an SGX Enclave, but that has a hardware dependency and we want solutions that can run on any hardware, right? And so we're experimenting with a couple different approaches. Um, there's uh, active design work going on in this area. We would love to have more um, uh, collaborators in this particular area. Uh, and if you're interested in more, you can ask me about it or come to our, our, our meetings that I'll talk about at the end. But one a key difference between Windows and some other uh, scenarios is that in a Windows world, you have things like the Windows hypervisor that if you turn it on, then there's a technology called HVCI, Hypervisor Enforced Code Integrity, that say that even if you get root on the machine, you're running as administrator, you still can't inject code into the kernel. Okay? The hypervisor is providing that enforcement. Right. And so that means that there's a security distinction where there's an elevation of privilege attack in between those. Okay. That means that things like your JITED code path is actually not directly possible without having to get the science stuff signed by a signature that the hypervisor will trust, not just the kernel, but the hypervisor has to trust it. Okay. So this is actually this different uh, security model that the Windows hypervisor has. Okay. And this um, causes impact on us in the security hardening for Windows because we don't want to degrade that promise either. Right. And so uh, today the status in the project is that interpreted mode works with HVCI on, when HVCI is off, both interpreted and JITED mode work. Okay? So again, this is an area of active design work. Love to collaborate with uh, any of you in the community that wanna participate in this. Okay, so one of our core principles in doing the project is that we wanted eBPF to be easy to extend, right? There's lots of hooks and helpers and things that people are familiar with in the eBPF industry. Um, we've only just started, right? There's only a couple that we've started doing that we've started putting in the project already. We want to make it easy for other people to add them. Even people add them after, you know, outside of the project itself, right? You want to add a hook or a helper for your own subsystem or your own driver for Windows or whatever. Um, how do we make that be easy? So these are our goals for the project that in order to add a hook or helper, you should not need to recompile Windows, certainly, because you want to work with existing Windows. You shouldn't even need to recompile the eBPF for Windows project. In a particular, you shouldn't need to recompile the verifier or the jitter, and you shouldn't even need to reboot, okay, to add a new hooker helper. And so uh, to go along with that kind of a corollary is because it's, you can do all that without rebooting, then that means that there's this need for any user, developer, whatever, to be able to query the runtime to say, what is actually installed here? Which program types do I have? What helper functions are available on this system, right? So all this is made possible with a runtime introspection mechanism and so hooks and helpers are added via new extension drivers, right? And that was that eBPF shim piece that I talked about before that's separate from the runtime, which was the execution context box on the bottom right. So you can add a new extension driver at any time. The extension driver is what implements the hooks or helpers, right? And then the hooks and helpers are then provide, are provided metadata. The extension provides the metadata about them to the runtime itself. So that the other components, the verifier, the jitter, and so on, can query the metadata and then act on the metadata as being data-driven, right? So the verifier, for example, doesn't have any prototypes hard-coded, right? It queries them at runtime, gets them from the execution context, and then operates on the prototypes and so on for verification purposes. Um, so all this means that it can be done without having to embed knowledge of these things in these other components, okay? This is a building block that actually allows other things in the future, like we wanna allow other execution contexts to be added at runtime, like new services that come up that can attach uh, programs to you. 
or I want to allow my verification to be done off machine and use signed programs, right? We're very interested in this notion of signed eBPF programs that's been talked about in a couple of places. I um, think this is a great approach that we would love to be able to leverage uh, even on the Windows project here. And so we're trying to design to make that be possible in the future. So with that, let me just thank everybody for your participation. We have the link to our repo here. We have weekly office hours. We have a Zoom meeting basically every Monday morning. The link there is in the GitHub. We would love to have additional contributors. Um, we just go over open issues, pull requests, whatever it is that people want to discuss, at least triage all new issues. If you file an issue, you have a feature request for us, feel free to file an issue. Uh, if you want to contribute, that'd be lovely. We would love to have more contributors. We use, you know, help wanted and good first issue and we triage issues. So uh, it'd be really easy if somebody else wants is interested in the project and wants to contribute into this project. Uh, but otherwise, we'd love to continue collaborating with the other building block pieces that I mentioned. Uh, we've seen great efforts across the community right now and love to see that continue. So thanks for listening and happy to take any questions now.